Well, as Pastor Trish was saying, you know, this last week was Valentine's Day, you know, February. Um, I, I necessarily didn't have a, a, a sermon on, on love uh, uh, per se. You know, we were talking about some other things that I felt that the Lord has impressed upon my heart and my spirit to share. And, and, uh, but this morning, we're going to talk about some things and uh, hopefully you'll receive something. Amen. Uh, if uh, you want to hear about love, right? Right at 3 p.m., Pastor Mike and Debbie uh, have have dedicated the month of February uh, to ministering on love. Amen. And so, if you want to get that dose, that word, come out at 3 p.m. because Pastor Mike and Debbie are, have been ministering on love. And so, you'll have a word. Amen. So. You know, the Lord has impressed upon me to share with you this morning some things about relationships this morning. See, because there should be love in every relationship, amen? But once again, sometimes our relationships aren't as good as they, sh they should be for one or many reasons. So I felt that we needed to take a look at some of our relationships that many of us do have and, and, and take a closer look to see, are, are, are my relationships healthy? Amen? Because uh, have you heard of an unhealthy relationship? There are unhealthy relationships out there, right? And it has nothing to do with just a, a, a boyfriend and girlfriend or, or husband and wife. We're talking there are unhealthy relationships with uh, family members, whether it be parent, child, brother, sister. You, you get where I'm going with this? There are unhealthy relationships. So we're going to talk a little bit about relationships this morning. And so as we get ready to get in the Word, I just ask that, you know, you just kind of block out your mind from, you know, any distractions and kind of just, you know, try to press into what the Lord is trying to share with you this morning. Amen? You know, so the first relationship that I want to focus on, obviously, is the parent-child relationship. But... Don't think that, well, because you're not a child or maybe not even a parent, that you cannot learn something from this. Amen? Because, see, every single one of us has influence in other people's lives. Whether you are a parent by blood, by birth, or whether you're a, like a spiritual parent. You have any uncles in the house? Any aunts, any theas in the house? See, you have, uh, uh, you know, certain relationships that you're able to speak into the younger generation's lives, amen? And so you need to look at those relationships and say, am I, am I being a, a positive role model to my nieces and nephews? Am I, what, what am I teaching them, amen? Some of you may be godparents, right? Now I know in, 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 in some churches, you know, the godparent is more of a, just a, a title means you have to buy them presents on their birthday. And not just you know, a present, but I mean, now you got to go out and, you know, out of your way and spend a little bit more than you normally would, you know, because you're the Nino or Nina, so you, you got to hit a home run, right? And, and if not just with birthdays, Christmas, and all these other little things, and, and so if you are a godparent, a Nino, a Nina, you know, and I know in, 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 you know, mostly in the Mexican culture, you know, it's expected that you do certain things for the child on these certain holidays, amen? But see, really, it's about being a spiritual parent to them, amen? Spiritual. And so we're talking about the parent-child relationship, right? And you know what's interesting about the parent-child relationship is that, you know, when it comes to parents, whether it's the mother or the father, you know, very interesting that when the child... You know, uh, you know, falls down, you know, and hurts their knee, you know, normally they don't go running to daddy. They can, but it's mama they go running to. Why? Because mama has that nurturing thing inside of her, amen? She's just able to just nurture the child so much better than the dad can. Not that dads can't nurture, but I'm just talking generalizations, amen? But see, when the child... Uh, you know, is afraid at night. Maybe here's a noise. Maybe it's daddy they go running to because daddy is the protector. Amen? Or at least should be. Amen? And see, we see those different roles, you know, as a, as a parent. 
But see, the thing is this, is that regardless if you're a mother or father, you know, we need to evaluate and say, what, you know, am I, you know, being the best parent that I can be? Now, some may say, well, pastor, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm not together with my children's mother, so I don't get to see them all the time. Well, that's okay. You don't have to be a weekend parent, amen? The bottom line is you can be actively involved in your child's life, but it takes effort. It takes effort to be actively involved in your child's life. So just because maybe you're not together with the mom or the dad, that's okay. Remember, being a parent means you're, you have to be actively involved in the child's life. Amen? But I just want to share a few things uh, on, on these relationships. Let's go to 2 Timothy, and uh, we're going to go to chapter 3. 2 Timothy... And we're going to go here to chapter number 3. And we will be here in verse number 15. Look at what the word says right here. 2 Timothy 3.15. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. So I guess what we're hearing here is that there's parents that have been teaching their children about God and the things of God from early on. See, th this is good right here. This is good right here. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. See, this is good right here because this is something that we need to do first and foremost for our children is teach them about the things of God. Amen? Amen. Teach them about the things of God. In Deuteronomy, it tells us also how often we should be talking about the things of God. I believe it's in Deuteronomy 6 where the Word of God says basically that when we wake up and we go out through the day and before we go to bed, we should be talking about the Lord God. Amen? Yeah. These are the things we should be instilling in our children. And see, if we were instilling, you know, the goodness of God and the things of God in our children, we won't have to be turning on the TV at 6 p.m. and seeing them running amok. Amen? Because it starts in the home. It shouldn't be left up to the teacher at school to discipline your kid or to tell Johnny what's right from wrong. Sorry, Johnny. <laughs> or Susie. Right? And it shouldn't be up to the policeman to teach your kid about, you know, doing right and wrong. It starts in the home, amen? And this is where, where it's supposed to be. And see, as we teach our children about the things of God, right, we, we will see the benefit of it. Because see here in verse 15, it tells us that it's able to make you wise, amen? Amen? It's able to make you wise. Now, don't say, ah, oh, pastor, you know what? My kids are grown already. I don't want to hear this right now. Well, you might be a grandparent. How about that? And, as, and the thing is this, is that we need to be teaching the kids and the grandkids about God. Amen? And as I mentioned earlier, maybe you don't have kids, but that's okay. You could be a spiritual father or a mother to others. You have neighbors. You have children that you may be around and you could be a spiritual parent to them. Amen? Amen? Maybe they're not getting it from their own parents, but you can be that influence that they look to, right? That, a, that example, that godly example. Amen? But see, what happens is when we teach the children about God, it says it's able to make them wise. Amen? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 22. And here in Proverbs 22, we're going to be in verse number 6. Proverbs 22, verse number 6. This is the old classic right here. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. See, there's so much to be said about this. If you train up a child, right, in the way that they should go, when they grow old, they will not depart from it. Amen? See, when we train up children in the things of God, although there may come a time when they reach adulthood where they say, no, nah, I'm not going to church today, Mom. Dad, I, I don't feel like it, or I just don't want to go to church. That's not my thing. That's okay. There's a foundation that's been laid. Amen? Amen. And when you've trained them up in the things of God, it says when they grow old, they will not depart from it. In other words, it's instilled in them. They're going to go back to it, amen? 
And see, that's the part of us being parents is that we uh, are, are to be teaching our children. That's what our job is, is to teach them and prepare them for life outside of our home. Amen? We've got to be doing this. See, so our job as parents is to train them up. Amen? Train them up. And then let's go to that topic. Nobody, well, I won't say nobody, but some people don't like to talk about it. Let's go to Proverbs 23.13. And in Proverbs 23.13, the Word of God says, Do not withhold correction from a child. For if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. Now I know some people take this literally and try to spank their children till they get tired, right? Now, this rod of correction doesn't necessarily mean it has to be, you know, spanking, but it can be. And just like anything else, spanking should not be for beating a child. It's to correct one's behavior, amen? Right? So, there's nothing wrong with a, with a little spanking every now and then, but once again, does the punishment fit the crime, Right? And, and you have to come to that determination. And then there comes a time where maybe the child gets too old to be spanked. Uh, for myself, I think when my kids, they hit about the age of, I think, 14, I think uh, it was time to put the belt away. Because I acknowledged and realized that they're getting older and, and I have to deal with them differently. But that doesn't mean that the rod of correction goes away. Amen? Because I'm still going to be able to correct them. It's just the bout maybe is not something I would do anymore. Now some of you may disagree with me and say, nah, maybe when they're 17, that's the time, or 18. I'm not going to argue with you about that. But like I said, this is just something I felt that I should not do anymore. I think there was an episode on Montel Williams a while back about, was it Montel or one of those talk shows about spanking. And I guess there was a parent that spanked their child for everything. They were getting kind of old, and, and I guess uh, they let themselves be spanked. And they're like, that hurt. <laughs> that, that hurt. Kind of to prove a point that, like, yeah, spanking, you know, is not maybe something you should be doing when they're at that age anymore. But the point being is this, is that there should be some level of correction. Amen? We have to be able to correct them. And that's what the, the Word of God is showing us right here, that... You know, that don't withhold correction from a child. Because, see, there are some parents that, that they want to be their kid's best friend. Right? And, 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 you know, I get it. I get it. You know, you don't want to see your kid, you know, um, you know, to be spanked. Or you don't want to hear, see your kid to be upset. I, and I get all that. But it's not going to benefit them if you withhold correction from them. Amen? And as a parent, we're not supposed to be their best friend when they're little. That comes later on when they become adults. Then there's more of a friendship involved. Amen? Let's talk about teenage relationships. Because, see, when your child becomes a teenager, the relationship does change. They're not little kids anymore. Right? So, so maybe you shouldn't be making their bed for them anymore. Right? Maybe they should start washing their own clothes. Maybe they should have some chores around the house for accountability purposes. Amen? Maybe they should learn how to cook meals. Right? Maybe they should learn how to cook for themselves. Because, see, as a parent, we're supposed to teach our kids how to be independent. Amen? And see, so if little Mary grows up and she don't know how to cook and she gets married to Johnny, right? What's going to happen when Johnny comes home? He's going to come home to a bologna sandwich, amen? He ain't going to get none of that good, hot, uh, uh, old-fashioned cooking. So the thing is this, is that it's good that we teach our kids how to be independent, amen? And just like with discipline, it changes with the teenagers because, see, they're going to test you. We know this. Right? But you see, you can't let them push your buttons. You got to learn to think outside the box and you got to remain cool. But the thing is, this is with teenagers, we got to be consistent. Right? This is something that I learned along the way. Right? Is that yelling doesn't really accomplish anything, it actually defeats the purpose. Right? Because I used to like to yell. Right? Uh, partly because uh, yelling was something I grew up with in the home. Right? So I figured, why not? <laughs> right? Why not? 
And then when I went into the Marine Corps, there was a lot of yelling going on because that was a way to get somebody's attention, right? Getting in their face and yelling at them, right? So, so the thing is this, is that yelling has its place, but really when it comes for discipline, it really has a counterproductive type of thing. But it took me some time to learn this, amen? Right? See, so if you want to be a good parent, you need to ask yourself, what am I doing to, to be a better parent? I'll just pray some more. That'll help, but there's still other things out there, and what we need to start doing is saying, am I doing everything I can uh, do to be a better parent? Such as reading books. There are a lot of good books out there. One of my spiritual father's uh, mentor is Dr. James Dobson. He is a child psychologist, but he also uh, teaches a lot on on the family and on on marriage and, and those types of things. And he's written a ton of books, a lot of free stuff he puts out there. You can even go to his website and listen to free little 30-minute little uh, episodes that he does on different topics called Focus on the Family. But the thing is this is there's a wealth of information there, amen? So the, the thing is this is that read books. Read books. How about going to a, a parenting seminar? How about going to parenting classes or, or conferences so that you can learn some things, amen? Because see, if you're not taking the time to invest in this, guess what? Then I would probably think that maybe your parenting skills are maybe not above par, amen? And I could be willing to bet that you're probably you know, uh, uh, how would you say, uh, uh, spinning your wheels in a lot of things dealing with those kids because you're doing everything based on what you know and there's a lot of other information out there that can help you, amen? And that's why it's good to learn other things, amen? So then your child becomes an adult, the relationship changes. See, that's when you got to step back and say, now I've done everything to prepare them, and now they have to make decisions for themselves, and you have to let them. You have to let them. But you're there for them. If they want to talk to you about it, if they want to get counsel, if they want to get wisdom from you, you're there for them. Amen? And then you're able to share some things with them that you couldn't share with them when they were children, and the relationship changes, and you become friends. Amen? But remember, that doesn't happen until they become adults. Amen? Speaking about parenting, let me talk to the young adults or the young teenagers, right, about relationships, because that's what we're talking about this morning. What's interesting is in the Bible, there's nowhere that talks about dating, right? There's no dating in the Bible, so what does that mean? You can't date? No, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is this, is that when it comes to dating, be careful. Because if you're not prepared for this, then it can do you some harm. Because if you're not prepared to date, then how do you go about it, right? I'll never forget, I'm going to pick on my daughter. She came to my wife and I, I think at the age of 9 or 10, and she told us, in her wisdom, that she wanted a boyfriend. And I was like, really? Okay, so let's talk about this. And, and I did a little experiment with her because, you know, she was our experimental child, being the oldest, in that, obviously, she's too young to have a boyfriend at 10, right? But try to tell the child that, right? So we did a little experiment, because I had told her about, you know, that it was going to be too much, that there's going to be too much expectation placed on her, right? And, and uh, you know, what does this mean about having a boyfriend? You know, obviously, it's only going to be a, a relationship at school because, the little fella's not going to be coming over to the house, and you're not going to be going to his house, right? You're too young for all that. I said, okay, fine. You, you know, you can see him at school. You call him your boyfriend. Well, I think the relationship lasted a week or two because uh, it was just too much because I guess it was expected that she spent every recess with the guy. <laughs> and it's not fun to spend every recess when your friends are, you know, I guess at the monkey bars or doing other things, right? Right? So that kind of got old really quick, and the point was made. Amen? But the thing is this, when it comes to dating, I like to share, 
uh, and I've done this with my children, but, you know, be careful about those dating, uh, uh, you know, those dates, because, see, you don't want to be alone with the opposite sex, because that's when things happen, right? So, rule of thumb, don't be alone with the opposite sex. I still try to hammer that home. Not everyone listens to me about that one, because that's when things happen, amen? I think adults can use this uh, uh, information as well. If you're not married, don't be alone with the opposite sex because that's when things happen, right? You've got to learn to protect yourself. But the thing is this, is that that whole dating thing is supposed to be a period where you're getting to, to know the other person. And, and the thing is, is this, is that I'm not an expert on dating, but I did date, I think, for two years before we got married. I think it helps you get to know the other person. And... Um, it can be a positive thing, but I think, uh, you know, there has to be some accountability. So that's all I'm going to talk about dating, right? But we're talking about relationships. Now let's talk about marriage. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, amen? Genesis chapter 2, we're going to go to verse number 18. Relationships is what we're talking about this morning. So in Genesis 2, 18, look at what the Word of God says. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone, and I will make him a helper comparable to him. What's very interesting about this in Genesis is God had just created Adam, and he's saying it's not good that Adam should be alone. But he didn't go and go create Eve right in the next uh, segment here what did he do he created the animals he created animals first right and so the thing is this is that God created animals after he told Adam or he said that it's not good that man should be alone I will make him a helper comparable to him he first created the animals and then he created Eve and what's interesting about that is when he created Eve here go to verse 24 Right? He says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. This hurts a lot of couples when they get married. Right? Because if a person still has mom and dad involved in their relationship, that's going to create problems. Right? So moms and dads, if you have adult children and they're married, you've got to learn to step back. Let your children handle their marriages. Now, give them advice. Hopefully pray for them. They come to you and you can share with them some things. But they're going to have to learn how to navigate through marriage on their own. Therefore, it's very important when we raise our children, we instill these kinds of things in them so that when they get ready to get married and take on a mate, they are fully equipped and prepared to be a good husband or a good wife. Amen? So that's why we have to do a good job in raising up our children. Amen? Right? Now, marriage... If people would put an effort in their marriage, there would be less divorce. Because, see, marriage is work. Amen? The, you know, there's no such thing as cruise control in a marriage. I can tell you that. In a couple months, it will be 29 years I've been married. Right? 29 years. It's been that long, huh? Wow. And I'll tell you, it is work. Because the thing is this, is that if you don't put the effort in it, there will be problems, right? There will be problems, even for pastors. Because, see, as a pastor, we're consumed with all your stuff going on out there, right? We're consumed with all your stuff going on out there. I couldn't tell you the amount of calls I get and, and, you know, and discussions I have to have with people trying to help them. And what's interesting is there are a lot of people that I'm working with that you don't even see in these chairs. They're not even here, but I'm helping them because that's what I'm called to do is help people. Amen? And the thing is this, is it's very time-consuming. Very time-consuming. And if I'm not able to balance my time, I could be spending more time with them and you than with her. So i got to make an effort to give her a little bit of time. Amen? i got to have balance in my life, so it takes effort. But when we're talking about marriage, is marriage is work. It takes effort. And the minute that one person stops putting in effort, that's when things start to go downhill from there. 
Because the other person is going to start to realize, well, why am I doing all the work when this person isn't doing anything? And then when you have both people saying, I ain't doing this for him, right? And I ain't doing that for her. Guess what? Now your hearts are getting cold towards one another. And then you start to walk around saying, I just think we've grown apart. We're at a different place in our lives. We just, you know, we're, we're not compatible anymore. That's a bunch of garbage, right? You've got to put the effort in if you want a good marriage, amen? And see, that's what the enemy wants. See, so relationships, remember this, they are work, but it takes time, amen? You've got to put time in your relationship for it to be of quality, right? And there's also a thing called compromise, right? You've got to do things maybe that you normally would not like to do because maybe the other person likes to do those things, right? You know what's interesting is that I, when I was praying about this, it came to my mind, you know, that, you know, God said it's not good that man should be alone, right? I showed you that in Genesis 2.18, I believe. It's not good that man should be alone. So if that is true, if God did say that it's not good for man to be alone, why do men have man caves? Why do men have man caves? Because they want to be alone. Right? They want to be alone. But see, God is telling us it's not good for us to be alone. Amen? It's not good for us to be alone. Something to think about, men. Something to think about. Now, I'm not saying to go home to your garage and, you know, and make it into a sewing room, okay? I'm not saying that. But, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have a man cave. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying, keep it in perspective. Balance. Amen? Balance. Because the thing is this, is that it takes time to have a quality marriage. And if you have a, a 9 to 5, if you have a job, right, and you have other commitments, you know, young ones at home and their, you know, their sports and their events and these kinds of things, right? Uh, uh, when do we have time for the marriage, right? Once again, everything's on autopilot because when do you have time? Because see, you got to have your time, right? You can't let go of that. i got to have my time. So when do we have time to work on our marriage? See, so that's how things can get out of whack. And that's why we got to have balance, amen? So if you're willing to put in the effort, you're willing to put in the work, you can have a quality marriage. Quality. See, because God gave us marriage, amen? God gave us marriage, and we can have a quality marriage marriage. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to talk about friendships. Friendships. So, if you're not married, you're not off the hook. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to go here to uh, verse number 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14. You know, last week uh, I was sharing with you that Pastor Mike and Deborah have been preaching on love. I believe Pastor Deborah shared this about being unequally yoked, right? It's just a terminology, right, of two animals that were tied together. They had a, a device called a yoke, right? It was a wood thing that went over their necks, and they had rope and stuff underneath to tie them together, almost like the way you see, like, uh, horses that are harnessed together, you know, that are pulling a, 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 one of those... Um, stagecoach things or some other type of device that's all a a a, a yoke is and so anything er, er, anyways it's something that ties you together so here in second corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 the word of god says do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness right friendships and see, what the Word of God is showing us here is that as Christians, we should be careful about our relationships, right? Even if you are married and you have friendships, those friendships that you have, how are those people's walks with God? If you have relationships and friendships with, with ungodly people, you might want to be careful on how close you get to these people. See, the Word's not telling us 
don't have any unbelieving friends because we need to be out there winning people to the Lord. But be careful who you allow to get close to you. Amen? Because see, what ends up happening is, if you're unequally yoked, what ends up happening is, is that they're going to have influence in your life. Those people who, who don't share the same values you, share, you, you have uh, are, are the same uh, biblical uh, principles and those types of things that you have, if they don't share those with you, they're going to have an influence on you. And you might disagree, but I'm here to tell you that if you spend time with these people, too much time, they're going to rub off on you. The Word of God tells us that he who walks with the wise will grow wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. We have to be careful who we rub elbows with. Amen? we got to be careful. And how many times have we seen this over and over again, where you have a person, they grow up in church, they know what the Word of God says, uh, but they go out and they fall for that rebel guy out there. Right? That guy who is not in church, right? who's not living for God, but then they say, well... I, I can, you know, bring them to God. That's, that's, I think God's calling me to win them to the Lord. And then they get married. And then what has happened is, then they get to a place and they realize, why ain't they changing? Right? Why isn't that? And it's not just for the girls, it's for the guys too. It could happen. Be careful who you marry. You don't want to marry an unbeliever because, see, it's like going uphill. Right? It's going up, you're going uphill. And then you're going to get to a place where you realize that they're not changing and they want to stay the same way they are. And it's like, hold on, you knew that before you married them. And now you're going to have to deal with it. Now, not to say that you won't marry somebody who's been in church their, their whole lives and won't have any issues. I'm not saying that either. But you're going to be in a better place spiritually. Because, see, if they are spiritually in tune, God can deal with those people people so much better amen so be careful who you let influence you be careful who is in your inner circle because it will have an impact to the positive or to the negative amen and therefore the word of god says be careful who you are tied to so the word says do not be unequally yoked now how about business relationships you want to be careful about who you do business with. Because, see, if you do business with an unbeliever, they may cause you to do something, right? Listen to this. They may cause you to do something that, that may compromise your integrity. See, because if you're dealing with business with an unbeliever, who are they accountable to? They're accountable to nobody. And guess what? When it comes to money... People will compromise themselves in a hot second. So be careful who you do business with. Make sure that they're believers. Amen? Not to say another Christian won't try to rip you off, but once again, the word is warning us, be careful who you are tied to, especially in business relationships as well. But once again, the Lord doesn't want us to stop our relationships with people because they don't go to church or believe in God. But you have to be careful on how close you get to those people. See, there's a reason for everything. See, Jesus was always amongst the sinners. But see, they didn't influence him to sin. See, he influenced them. You see, you see there was a difference going on there. He influenced them. Others, others did not influence him. Amen? So we want to be careful when it comes to relationships. Now, as we start winding down, I want to take you to the book of Acts chapter 13. And we know that the most important relationship of all is the relationship you have with the Lord Jesus. That should be the most important relationship in your life is the relationship with the Lord Jesus. Amen? Acts chapter 13, verse 22. And when he had removed him, he raised him up for them, David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, 
a man after my own heart who will do all my will. See, David was known as the man after God's own heart. Was David perfect? By no means was he perfect. David made many mistakes in his life. But see, one thing about David was he loved God, and when he did make a mistake, he was always accountable to go to God and make things right when he made a mistake. David had a good relationship with God. And the reason why he had a good relationship with God was because he would spend time with him. See, we, we, we learn in the Bible that then when David was a young boy tending to his father's flock out in the you know, field, tending to the father's flocks, that he had a harp that he would play. And he would sing songs to God. Think about it. He was out there all alone. Just him and the sheep and whatever other animals were out there. And he would sing songs to God. Now, he wasn't able to turn on the radio and listen to, is it 99.1? I don't listen to that station, but I've heard of it, right? 99.1, right? No, he was singing songs to God. He spent time with God. And we see what ends up happening is that the time he invested singing songs to God and working on his relationship with God, as he became a man, we see the great things that he was able to do for God because of the fact that he had a strong relationship with God. Amen? He had a strong relationship with God. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 16, and we'll wind down right here. 2 Chronicles. We're going to chapter 16. And we're going to be here in verse number 9, right after 2 Kings. So 2 Chronicles, chapter 16, verse number 9. Look at what the Word of God says right here. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. God is looking to bless people. Amen? God is looking to bless people. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Amen? See, he's looking for men and women whose hearts are his completely. So it's time to think about your relationship with the Lord. How is it? How, how strong is your relationship with the Lord? And that's okay. If your relationship with the Lord is not strong today, that's okay because, see, it can change, amen? It can get strong. And the only way it's going to get strong is that you've got to spend time with Him. And you'll hear me say this over and over again, is that coming to church on Sunday morning does not cut it, amen? You've got to have a lifestyle of spending time with God on a daily basis. You've got to create a routine. You've got to create a lifestyle of spending time with God, praying, reading His Word, you know, constantly getting fed, right, so that your spirit can get strong because Sundays will not cut it. Because think about it. All the other days of the week, what is it that's going inside of you? What's feeding you throughout, throughout the week? See, so the thing is this. Whatever you're hearing you know, the most is basically what you're going to be meditating on. See, your, your life heads in the direction of your most dominant thought. Your most dominant thought. That's the direction your life heads in. And so whatever it is you're hearing... More of is that direction it's going to go in. And if Sunday is the only time you're getting the word of God, I hate to be the, uh, or break it to you, but it's not going to cut it. So I want to encourage you. Know that if you spend more time with the Lord, you will benefit. See, I just showed you in the word of God that the Lord is looking for those that he can show himself strong. Or in other words, he's looking for those that he can bless. I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed. 
And he's looking for men and women whose hearts are his completely. Amen? If I can have everyone stand as we get ready to close this morning, God is looking to bless somebody. Are you wanting to be blessed? Are you willing to do what it takes? Amen? If I can have every uh, head bowed and every eye closed as we get ready to uh, leave this morning, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you because, see, God has more for you. Don't put any limitations on God. See, the limitations that are placed on God are the ones that we set on Him by only allowing Him to be in our lives on Sundays. And that doesn't cut it. He wants more. And in turn, He will bless you. Amen? He will bless you. So you need to ask yourself, what is the most important relationship in my life? See, it's what you put the most time into. And so I want to encourage you, put more time in your relationship with the Lord Jesus. Amen? Put more time into that. See, because if, if you haven't been, that's okay. You can change. See, and that's why we come to the church house, so that we can be encouraged, so that we can be edified, and so that we can be given, you know, a word of truth. Amen? Amen. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I call everyone here a doer of your word, not just a hearer only. Now, Father, I call everyone a man and woman of God. I call everyone here a man and woman after your own heart, Lord. Father, I, I speak this by faith. Father, I pray for your people that you would show them your goodness. Oh, Father, especially as we leave, Lord, that you would continue to just show them how much you want to bless them, how much you want to be a part of their lives. Holy Spirit, teach them and help them as they leave here this morning to think about a better lifestyle than maybe what they've been having. One where they spend time with you daily, Lord. Oh, Father, I thank you for your people. I speak blessings on them. And I thank you that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Oh, Father, we give you glory and we give you honor. You are worthy to be praised, Lord. We thank you. We thank you this morning. We bless your holy name. You are a good God, an awesome God, and one who has nothing but good things in store. You want to show us better things. All we have to do is be willing to do our part. Oh, Father, I thank you that you would show yourself strong to your people, Lord. Oh, we give you glory and honor in the precious name of Jesus. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. You may be seated.